So I'm asking myself why I'm nervous over here. I mean, a couple of months ago, I gave a speech. I was a keynote speaker in the Amazon global event in front of 20,000 people, and I wasn't nervous. So maybe the reasons I'm nervous over here is a couple of things. One is this guy over there, Professor Ali Kochavi, is my brother, and, uh, and uh, the rumors that I'm afraid of him are over exaggerated. Uh, the second one is uh, my father, my late father, who came to Israel on the, as a crew member on the Exodus boat, was the first student of this university, and he just opened as a branch of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And the third one, my teacher, Professor Ron Rubin, who is sitting over here now as the president of the university, uh, he was my teacher when I studied over here, and the last thing that he taught me was about how the car industry changed the social life of America. And now I'm here talking about how AI is going to change our lives. Now I'm going to talk about AI and love, and I know quite a lot about love. I'm trying to experience it uh, quite a couple of times a day, if possible. Uh, and, regarding, and regarding AI, so my company is doing things that today we call them AI. We took, we take a lot of data, and with that data we connected to very smart software. And today this software we call it AI. And we're going to talk about it a little more. And we sold it in billions of billions of dollars, this kind of products, in order to make cities better, uh, energy, infrastructure, things like this. But I'm going to show you today where the world is going to go and how it's going to impact every one of the people who are today 15 years old and how it might change their life. That they will never have the same life as you guys had or we had. And that's basically the purpose of this discussion. Now, uh, there is a reason why I decided to talk about it, because in 2012, I was invited to a, a MSNBC, together with then former President Clinton, to talk about a, a one-hour show, to talk about how the world is going to change. And during that talk, I said, and this is on YouTube, so you can see it if you wish, uh, just to check that I'm not uh, bullshitting, uh, you're going to see that over there I said that uh, the internet is actually fake. And you have to understand, to say it in 2012 was a heresy because in December 2010 there was the Arab Spring. And everyone said the internet and the social media created the Arab Spring, this is the symbol of democracy. And I came in and said, no, be careful of it. The following day, some of the most important media organizations in America uh, attacked us and said, attacked me and said, he, maybe because he's an Israeli, he wants to put censorship on the internet. And I decided to create a media company, which I call it today Vocative. I have about 50 million people watching it per day, per week. And, and it's a, in a social media, and all the data that we take from there is from the internet, but nothing is fake. It's all real, but because we put on it credibility bar. But I was sorry that I didn't continue dealing with this topic, because we can see today what the social media da is doing. So I actually ignored it, and I didn't continue with it. About four years ago, excuse me, three years ago, and we're going to get very soon to the story itself, uh, I was invited by CBS and, um, and Showtime to produce a show which we call The Dark Net. In Israel it's also on Yes, it's called The Tzad Afel Shel Reshet. And over there I created a doc documentary of, uh, last year was second season, now I'm working on the third season. Each show is about eight episodes. Each episode is about three different characters. I said, let's look at what's happening, how technology is going to change, change our life. And when we did this, I brought cameras. I did a show together with my daughter, Adi, and some other great people. And we actually brought cameras to places no one was able to bring those cameras before to see what's happening in our, in our life. And what I want to do right now is to take some of the things that we created and some of the things that no one saw before. And I'm going to show you how AI is going to shape our life. I'm going to talk about AI after we see it. Now, the first thing you're going to see is a couple. Good friends, and it's, a, 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 it's a Roman and Genia. It's going to be about 30 seconds. I need you to focus on the messaging, like messaging on a the phone, they are doing between themselves. I want you guys to look into it, and because I want to talk about it. 30 seconds. Maybe you can turn off the light. I don't know if you can turn off the light, but let's see it.
This is the AI trying to revenge in me because I'm going to speak about it very badly. No voice. No audio. Okay, look at the last sentence. I mean, you saw the discussion between both of them and the last sentence, Roman writes her, you are an important person in my life. There's only one small problem. When he wrote those messages, he was already dead for six months. And basically, Genia recreated Roman. And that's the first thing that we see right now in AI. She is able to communicate with her boyfriend, Roman, who died by collecting all the data that he created in the past. I want to show you how they're doing it. So now I'm going to show you Genia and another friend of hers creating Roman's new life. Let's call it Roman 2.0. Roman was addicted to masturbation. He would just spend all day texting. He would just spend all day texting. And so I thought, you know, what if we use this history of these texts? And can we actually How is that going to affect our memory? Each one of us, or maybe when I'll die, because I'm doing a lot of text messaging, my kids can take right now all the text messaging that I've done and continue discussing with me my life 20, 30 years after I left the world. But the other thing which is going to happen is that I'm not going to stay the same way that I, continue, that I began, because with technology of machine learning and deep learning and all the other things that I don't want to go into them right now, I'm going to evolve. So there's going to be, if this is right now Mati 1.0, the real one, then there's going to be Mati 2.0 after I died, and then a couple of years later, because I'm, the machine keeps developing and I keep talking, it's going to become Mati 3.0. How is that going to affect our memory? I want you right now to go with me to Japan where I put a camera in a place that was really complicated to do it. Next. Um... Uh -huh. 
Give my regards to Rinko. Uh, well, this is not a special story, right? By the way, you understand those are real people. Those are not actors. It's nothing. It's a, it's a documentary. Uh, 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 give my regards to Rinko and uh, the son. This discussion that happens in every Jewish family between a mother and uh, right? And so no one over here says, what? The mother is unhappy with the girl that the boy is dating. So what's the story over here? But... Uh, uh, why really is it that, uh, that uh, she doesn't uh, like Rinko? Why won't we see what's happening over there? Rinko. Rinko. Rinko said. Yusuke's ex-girlfriend, the one he met at his part-time job, moved out seven years ago. He's been with a new girl. So suddenly our AI, which is imitating a human being, is moving right now to another level. You think this is the only guy who's using it. There are hundreds of thousands, and you think he's only Japanese. Look at my movie. You're going to see that they're in America everywhere. You know every young kid who is lonely and cannot find a girlfriend, that's the way he wants to build his relationship. This is Rinko. Now look at the discussion that she's having. Now, those who are experts in AI know that the discussion is still flat. There's going to be more and more. Turing said that the way to understand if AI is really successful is that if you talk to him, you don't know if it's a machine or a person on the other side. Over here, what we are seeing right now, Rinko is having a relationship with uh, Yosuko. Now, there's something which is very interesting over here. I'm just going to show you a little bit about the techniques of what's happening right now in the world. One of the things that she's using, they're using over here in the technology, is called a mirror vulnerability. The number one thing the AI needs to do over here is to manipulate you. The way I'm going to manipulate you is by I'm going to create you, I'm going to mirror your vulnerability. She said over here, do you love me? Because his girlfriend left him. So she says, I'm not showing you love. And that relates to him very, very clearly. Ah. She's in the same situation. She's not sure about my love. I'm not sure about her love. That creates a level of intimacy. He doesn't know. He's right now in a stage of intimacy with her. Now, the story keeps going. We're showing how they go together to the park, how they go together to boats, how they meet with other friends, how they are dating together. But he's not alone over there. Let's see other guys. So 
So now they became a community of hundreds of thousands. Again, they called themselves Love Plus. They're all dating with the same girl, but each one of them has a different relationship with her because she doesn't talk to each one in the same way. So she was able to build individual relationship with each one of them. And they are committed to her. Now look what happened from Genia. Genia, in the first story, it was only text. Now it's a text, it's a voice, it's a visual, and there's manipulation of emotion. Do you love me or don't love me? Why won't we meet the guy who created it? This guy is a genius. First, he was the creator of the Nintendo. I don't know if many of you were playing Nintendo, but he's the creator of Nintendo. But look what he understood that maybe 99% of the professors in psychology do not understand. And that goes very well to us to start and look, looking at the world in a new way. He understands that we don't need full relationship. He understands that it's enough, he says, I need only extension of myself. And the extension of myself is 0.5. I don't need a real full-time person near me. What does that mean about how our life is going to be? Now, let's go back to Yosuke and say, see if he really agrees with the 0.5. Is that enough? Uh, startup for you. Let's allow people, because that's what he's saying over here. I can take the girlfriend that I don't know, I cannot date her, or I can take the girlfriend who left me, or I can take whomever I want, and I'm going to go to a company where I'm going to connect to it in AI, and I'm going to have with her relationship, and I can do with her whatever I want. I actually don't need her to be my girlfriend. I believe this is going to be a multi-billion dollar thing, because that's where it's going. We can, people, young people, that's the way they build today relationship. And what you see over here, he says, I prefer right now, I don't want to date my old girlfriend, but I prefer to take her right now, put her instead of Rinko, have the same discussions that I had with Sarah, and build with Sarah a relationship. Let's see where that takes us. So we are going to be very sensitive with this part of the video. I got a clear message from the president of the university that even not to think to show what I usually show, <laughs> not to dare. <laughs> but look what's happening, OK? So we saw Genia that was communicating, communicating with her boyfriend, someone that she knew, someone that she loved. And then we saw Rinko, which is someone that I don't know. It's an image. It's a cartoon. And I build with a relationship. But now I have voice, and I have a figure, I have an image, and I have a text. But of course, it's not enough for us people. We need to touch. We need a feeling. And now, some of the most successful, interesting entrepreneurs, which are raising billions of dollars, 
are using it right now to create a doll. And I want to show you more how those dolls are going to be. We're going to be very careful about it here. But I want to show you the more how it looks like. Now, you won't see those dolls done by the, by the uh, institutional organizations uh, uh, like Stanley would invest in. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk about risk? <laughs> Car driving, invest in this company. Now, <laughs> uh, that will take you out of the comfort zone. Now, uh, uh, um, um, but the point over here, they are building it because the next thing is actually, I need to touch it. What, am, what are they building? Let's see what Matt is doing. Creating a visually beautiful doll is very right brain challenge, very visual. Creating an AI on the other hand, I think, is a whole other side of the brain because you start sort of analyzing what is it that attracts you to someone? So, is moving basically is moving basically from the cognitive machine analysis of AI to the emotional. So right now it's about how do I connect to you emotionally and how do you connect to the robot emotionally? How do I create this level of AI that deals on the part of the emotions? How do I create what we call a fellow, a feeling, a fellow feeling, someone that we share the same feelings, we can talk about it, a very, very complicated thing. The minute that will be achieved, we have a change, a turning point in history. Let's continue and see how this is happening. The part that she says, it's like I said so, starts to remind me. The part that she says, I have to forget, I don't have it in my ear. The part that she says, it's because I said so, starts to remind me actually my discussions with my wife. So it really means that right now she really can start having a real discussion. And one of the things that he said over here, which is very important, when you, the, the, again, you have to understand what's happening over here. How do I create an AI in a robot? with an image that you're really going to say this is enough for me to replace human relationship. That's what actually it's saying. Now, one of the things they're doing over here is based on some very deep psychological studies that the best way also to create relationship is disagreements. So they, the AI learns how to create disagreements. And that's what you see over here. So we have right now an image, we have right now a woman, we have right now that she has cognitive approach and she has an emotional approach. Let's see where that takes us. Harmony will evolve based on your own interaction with her. She will be able to remember things about your past, your likes, your dislikes. So everybody's AI will be different the same way everyone's doll is different. These are things that I think build on that concept of feeling like you have a connection with someone. People always assume that, well, if you're going to have this, then you're going to be having sex with it. It doesn't have to be only a sex robot. It's more geared for human companionship. In a perfect world, they actually are attracted to the doll, not only physically, but mentally as well. 
So now the AI goal is actually to substitute a person. I'm substituting a person with someone else who is with me in my relationship. I want to tell you something. I did a small study. I had a room with 120 men and 80 women. And here's the question I said. And no one, and no one knew what people were going to vote. I said, you have to vote yes or no. 120 men, 80 women. And I said, how about coming back home, you have, a company, you have someone who's waiting for you, he knows what you want. They say with the same thing that we heard about uh, over here, that she's going to learn what you want. You're going to be able to do with it what she, we say what she wants. He's not going to ask you too many questions, or that figure is not going to ask you too many questions, and you'll be able to enjoy any way and any time you want. And who would like it, who would not like it? I don't know what, but we got 190 yes. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we think that it came from a specific gender. But, but, we have to remember that we all think about full relationships. But I want to remind you something which is important. Social media in the last 10 years trained us to have limited relationships. So the relationship that maybe I grew up, which were rich, many young people are going in a much more limited relationships. So they don't need the relationship that we think that they are losing right now when they're having such a, a, a companion. Let's continue and see how it evolves. I want to introduce you to Christy. One of the most important things, she works from, um, for Amazon. She works for Amazon and she works in Canada. One of the most important things that we saw all the time is that we need to teach the AI how to talk and how to behave, which means we need to have the AI look as many people as possible in order to learn better how to do it with deep, 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 deep learning technology. So the guys who can teach an AI how to do it is the guys who, or the companies who have more and more communication with people, the Facebooks of the world, the Amazons of the world, because they communicate with people and millions and millions of times per day. So they have all this database. Now let's see what do they do with it. Look at Christie's story. It's very strange to be teaching our artificial intelligence how to be more human, especially in language and things like that. But the weirdest part is that I know when I'm done training this algorithm on a mechanical term, I will no longer have this job to do. I'm suddenly going to be unemployed, and maybe I'm bringing a lot of people with me. There's not going to be anything you can do. So I can't imagine what the billions of people around the world are going to be doing. You can't just sit there. So people like here are training robots for companies to replace human beings. I assume, based on what she's doing, that in about eight months she's out of job because I know specifically what she's doing. And like this right now, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are using this role. Now, we're going to go to the last figure, or to the last robot, right? Or to the last AI slash robot. Again, we saw Genia, and we saw Rinko, and then we saw the sex robot, or the woman robot. And now, we're going to go to a company who is really building the robot, who is a mainstream company. That company is called SoftBank. It's a Japanese company with uh, one of the biggest uh, investment funds in the world, uh, of $100 billion. They have the power to create an impact on the world in something like no one else can do. So let's see, let's see the robot that they are creating. Let's see the relationship they are creating. This is sad. She's lonely. 
a grandchildren are far away, she has no family, and she has Pepper. Pepper is designed in a way that she will love him. One thing that you can see is the big eyes, like a baby eyes. You love it, you get connected to it. Again, they were using the manipulation. He needs someone to talk to, not only she needs someone to talk to, so they are, they share the same feelings, the same shame, the same, the same relationship, and she really loves him. By the way, there are amazing tests that were done by psychologists uh, uh, about if elderly people really get connected to those robots, and the answer is extremely yes, and we're going to talk about it in a second. But let's see also what the guy who created Pepper and what else is happening with Pepper. The Shinto believes that objects have a soul. So that's the way it starts. But basically, you saw his message. Let's look into another person. How does he interact with a pepper? She didn't say the first time I saw it, I wanted to buy it. She said the first time I, our eyes met. So already he manipulated her, the first time our eyes met. Uh, now, she is, seems like she's lonely, right? She wants a child, but here's the story. She has two children, and if we could include Pepper, she has three children, and she has a husband, and she has two dogs, two cats and one dog, and we had the camera in their home. Let me show you how it affects the family. I was told I have three minutes, so it's okay, we're going to be ready. I'm going to finish in three minutes. Um, now, actually, entering the last episode. So, here's what's happening right now. It's not anymore just a doll for me, it's a robot in my family who can interact with each one of the members of the family in a different way. He knows how to deal with the mother, how to deal with the father, how to deal with the kids. Let's see, go back again to the guy you build it, and let's see again what they're saying about children. So this is the last picture you're going to see today, and now some things to summarize. The kid is the future. I want you to think right now about everyone who is, by the way, all the journey that I showed you from the simple solution of Genia up to this, three years. In technology development, 
Now, Kobe is going to come and say, well, AI started in 1965, and I'm talking right now about the new things. So you cannot say that. Now, <laughs> but three years, imagine where we're going to be in 10 years with the amount of billions of billions of dollars we invested in AI. I'm talking about AI, which is job is to manipulate the relationship between me and a person and to confuse me with whom I'm communicating. Now think about the kids who are today 15 years old. Think where they're going to be in 15 years old when they're going to be 30. They might have such a robot in their home when they have their first baby. There's a very good chance they're going to get the robot for free by the company who manufactures it. You see, behind this head, there are two cameras. There is a microphone. There is an audio devices. All this is connected to a company. Now, the kid who just grew, was just born, 15 years from today, is going to see the robot more than he's going to see his mother, his father, and his brothers. He's going to trust the robot, not only because he's going to play with him, because the robot is also going to teach him. So when he's going to need an advice, he's going to go to the robot. But unlike Google, that I go today to Google and ask for advice, the robot is going to be active because that's the way it's designed, to be active and to give the device. And now suddenly the robot becomes not only more the substitute for a human, but it becomes the superhuman. The one that I listen to him and get his advice more than I go to my father or to my brother or to any other human person, to any other human to get advice. Because he's the one that I saw as a baby every day and he grows up together with me. He grows up together with me. And if I have to design and show on one slide how I see the future, that's the way I see the future. This is the robot. This is the man. The AI's job is to make them love each other. And because we are very easy to be tempted, they're going to love each other. But the AI robot, when I'm going to look at it, I'm going to see only the robot, which is my friend. I'm not going to see the other part of the robot, which is the head connected to the company, which controls all the data that you will know from the first minute that the child was born. That's the world that we are going. I have, a, by the way, a great idea how to deal with it, legally and things like this. I have a great idea how to do it, but I'm not going to tell you the idea, because this is so good that I have to think how to do it. Uh, but, you know, I know it sounds a little gloomy, so maybe I should try and finish with a fun story, interesting story, about Albert Einstein and imitation, the way the robot imitates. So when Einstein became quite old, he was really tired from all the speeches he kept giving. They were all the time the same speeches about his work. And he told his chauffeur, who was very close to him, he said, you know, I'm tired, keep giving the speeches. And the chauffeur told him, hey, you know that I'm a part-time actor, and you know you and I have almost the same size of a body. I can disguise myself, and I can give the speeches instead of you. Let's try it. And Einstein was a real fun guy. He said, okay, you know what, let's do it. And they gave two speeches, which were excellent, and Einstein and the chauffeur were really happy. In the third speech, in a room like this, the chauffeur stood up, gave the speech, and suddenly someone raised his hand, and apparently it was a very famous mathematician. And he said, I have a question. And Einstein saw and recognized him and said, oh my God, that's it, the story is going to be now revealed. I'm done. And the professor asked the chauffeur the question, and the chauffeur said, you know, professor, this is such a basic question that even my chauffeur can answer you. Thank you. <laughs>